So in our house, there's a rule, all right? Now, there are a few rules, but this one's really important. And the rule is that you are not allowed to play any Christmas music until the 1st of December. That is a rock-solid rule in the Clark household. One, uh, there are really two reasons for that rule. One is that I am of the opinion that Christmas music should not be played other than in the Christmas season. And that begins on the 1st of December. I know, I know, Advent starts before that, but it starts on the 1st of December. Plus, my birthday's in November, and I forbid any Christmas talk before my birthday. (laughs) People ask me, what do you want for Christmas? I haven't had my birthday yet. Give me a minute. But the second reason for that rule is, is Rachel, my wife. After nearly 10 years of marriage, nearly 10 years, she's realised that when I start playing Christmas music, I don't stop playing Christmas music. I love it. 24-7 throughout Christmas, uh, there's just Christmas music playing. And as far as Rachel is concerned, the 1st of December is early enough. Put simply, the reason for this rule is that it boils down to that Christmas, Christmas music shouldn't be played before the 1st of December because it's not Christmas yet. But there's this guy, and you've probably heard of him. Every year he gets wheeled out on the telly, much to my dismay. His name is Andy Park. If you're listening, Andy. And he celebrates Christmas Day every single day of the year. Have you seen him? You've seen him? You must have seen him. You must have seen him. Thank you, Tony. His name's Andy Park. He celebrates Christmas Day every single day of the year, and he has done since 1994. Every day he has a full turkey dinner. Every day he watches the Queen's speech from the year before. He re- rewinds it and rewatches it every day. Uh, every day he sends himself a Christmas card, so he receives one every day. He has a present that he opens every day. And all of this with his Christmas tree and his decorations up every single day of the year. I get it, okay? I get it. He loves Christmas. I love Christmas. Christmas Day is fantastic. And yes, perhaps some of us, you know, along with the song, we wish it could be Christmas every day. But it isn't. And it can't be. Because it's not Christmas every day. July is not Christmas. August is not Christmas. And November is not Christmas. So don't live like it's Christmas. Talking to you, Andy Park, if you're listening. Why am I talking about Christmas when it's not Christmas? I made that very clear. Well, the point is that this is exactly the warning that Jesus is giving in this parable. Okay? Not about Christmas, but about his kingdom. About his kingdom. Jesus is teaching the people listening and us that although his kingdom is about to begin in the context of this parable, it will not yet be in its fullness. Okay, just just bear with me. It's going to become clear. Look at verse 11. As they heard these things, so this has been linked very closely to the uh, story of Zacchaeus that we've just had. As they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable. Why did he tell a parable? Well, because he was near to Jerusalem. Is that all? No. And because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. So what we see here in verse 11 is that there are two connected reasons why Jesus is telling this parable and why he's telling it now. Firstly, because they are near to Jerusalem. They're getting near Jerusalem. And we know, don't we, what does Jerusalem mean? It means the cross. Because they're getting near to the cross. And secondly, because they thought the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. And let's be fair, Jesus' followers had a very good reason to, to believe, to expect the kingdom of God. They were right to expect the kingdom of God. We've seen several places throughout Luke already that Jesus has talked about the kingdom of God being at hand. In, in chapter 11, verse 20, he says, but, it, but, it, but if it is by the finger, finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And indeed, he was casting it out by the finger of God, and therefore the kingdom has come upon you. <laughs> Luke 17, 21, he says, Behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. So Jesus has been talking about 
the kingdom being here. And he knows that his followers are expecting his kingdom. But, of course, he also knows their hearts, doesn't he? He knows uh, what they're thinking and he knows that they don't understand fully what his kingdom's going to look like. Many of them, as we'll see in the next chapter or so, believe that Jesus is coming to Jerusalem to sit on the throne, on the earthly throne in Jerusalem. That he's come to kick out the Romans, to kick out their enemies. But that's not what it's going to look like, is it? Not yet. Jesus knows that in less than a week's time, he's going to be nailed to a cross. And many of the people who are even stood with him now, as he tells this very parable, many of the people who are stood with him now, when they see him nailed to that cross, are going to be happy about it. Some of them are going to be scared. And most of them are going to wonder how it happened. Why is Jesus nailed to this cross? How on earth is this the kingdom that we've been waiting for? And so Jesus tells this parable to teach them what the kingdom is like and how it is gained and and, and also something of the time scale of its completion. Because the danger is that if we don't grasp the teaching of this parable, what Jesus is teaching, we can fall into the trap of having an over-realized eschatology. Okay? Now what do I mean by that and why is it dangerous? Simply put, it means that we are over-realizing, we're making more real than they are, the eschaton, the last days. Making uh, them more real now than they are. That is, living as though things that have not yet happened yet are actually in effect. Are you with me? That's the danger, isn't it? We, we, we look forward and we look forward to all the things that are going to be and we live as though they're happening now. Let me give you an example. A really obvious and probably the most obvious and the most dangerous example would be kind of um, wealth and health preaching, prosperity gospel preaching. Health and wealth preaching says Christians shouldn't be ill. We have the power of Christ in us and so if we have faith and we pray then we will be well. The spirit will heal us because we are in Jesus and he is Lord. And they'll usually misappropriate several bits of the Bible. Most usually um, Isaiah 53 verse 5 where it talks about by his wounds we are healed. And pulling that out of context, uh, they completely understand, misunderstand that. The Bible, however, it does promise this reality for Christians, doesn't it? It does promise that we will know healing, we will know wellness. But When? When is that promised as, a, as an absolute guaranteed right, as it were? Not right, right's not the right word, but an absolute guaranteed thing that's going to happen. Revelation 21. That's when we read about it, don't we? Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. He goes on to say, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. There is coming a day when all who believe and have faith in Christ will have perfect healing, perfect bodies. So it won't be healing, it's what we call resurrection. But we put our souls in danger when we live as though the present, the now, has all the promises of that future already in effect that is yet future that is not happening now let me tell you this evening and this is important to hear if you have an illness if you've lived with pain for much of your life uh, perhaps depression infertility chronic pain whatever it may be there is a coming there is coming a day when you will stand before jesus made completely new but that's not today And it may not be today that you are healed. God does work. Any healing is from God. Sometimes he uses doctors. Sometimes he uses medicine. Sometimes he uses ways we cannot understand. But it may not be today for you. And you know what? That's okay. 
that's okay. It doesn't feel okay, but it is okay. Because the danger of over-realizing our eschatology is that it's wrong. And so it leads us to believe one of two things. If we are ill and we believe that we shouldn't be, it leads us to believe that either one, we don't have enough faith. That's a horrible thing to believe, isn't it? And you keep chasing after it and chasing after it. Or worse, we will come to the conclusion that, well, Jesus' kingdom can't be real then. Because I've been told I shouldn't be ill and I am. <coughs> Health and wealth preaching is dangerous. It's dangerous to our souls. It makes us try and chase faith when Christ has done it all. And it causes us to doubt him and his kingdom. You see, there is a now and not yet aspect of Jesus' kingdom. That's, that's the way we need to understand it. That's hard to understand it. It's now, but it's not yet. Jesus reigns. He reigns now. He is seated on high by the right hand of the Father in heaven. And he is reigning. And we say hallelujah to that. But it's not yet consummated. It's not yet complete. It's not yet final. There is more. There is more when he returns, when he comes back. And so this parable is teaching us that there is an interim between the two phases, as it were, of Jesus' earthly career. And this was really hard for Jesus' disciples to understand. The the idea of a, a delay is how they would see it was against their firm conviction that Jesus would set up his earthly kingdom immediately. That's what we read. They were expecting the kingdom immediately. Even up to Acts chapter 1 verse 6, at the ascension, even up till then, they still held out this hope that Jesus was going to bring the kingdom fully then. We read this in Acts 6, uh, 1, 6 to 7. He says, So when they'd come together, they asked him, that the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority. And shortly after that, he ascended to heaven. They they got it. If you read the rest of Acts, they understand. Paul understands. But up until that point, they were still hoping that maybe this was it. It was going to be finalized. But it hasn't been. Not yet. The kingdom... From the cross until he returns is a kingdom that is now and not yet. It is now, the kingdom is now and yet there's something of it which is not yet. And do you know what? It can be hard. It can be hard living in the now and not yet. And so Jesus (coughs) tells us this parable to help us. Jesus begins his parable by telling us about a nobleman who goes away. Look at verse 12. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten miners. And he said to them, engage in business or literally make a profit until I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know what they had gained by doing business. The parable is a story about a nobleman who leaves his people for a time, for a while, while he goes away to receive power. To receive power and authority and rule. To receive a kingdom. Uh, And later returns with it. Which is what Jesus is about to do. Isn't he? Jesus is trying to use this earthly picture which would be very familiar to them. To help them understand uh, that in order to gain the kingdom. He first has to leave. He has to leave them. And, And do you note it's not a small trip. It's not a small thing. He goes, the nobleman goes into a far country. Jesus is, is, is alluding to the fact that what he's going to do is going to take him a long way from them. 
Now, this earthly picture, as I said, would be very familiar to Jesus' audience. Uh, This is how regional kings in that time got their power. Um, It's how Herod became king of of the region around Jesus' birth. He was given the throne by Caesar. Uh, And Josephus uh, records that um, the things that Herod did to earn his throne, he goes away on delegations, he he defeats certain enemies of, of the of Caesar, he he does the will of Caesar. He brings political peace uh, for Caesar. He does all these things for Caesar. He does the will of the one who could grant him a kingdom. In this case, Caesar. So, in this parable, we might ask then, what does this journey to the far country correspond to? What does it teach us? Well, it corresponds to Jesus's death and resurrection. That's the far country that Jesus needs to go to. That's where he must go. That's what he must do to secure his kingdom. And in doing so, he, he, he has to leave his people for a while, doesn't he? An earthly nobleman must show his political power. Jesus at the cross did the will of the Father. The one who could grant him the kingdom. He defeated the enemy of the Father death and sin he crushed the serpent's head and he rose to his throne in resurrection power he gained his kingdom jesus does the work at the cross and at his resurrection is where he gains his kingdom ephesians chapter 1 verses 19 makes that really clear for us Uh, going on to through 23 it says according to the working of his great might that he worked in christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and far above every name that is named not only in this age but also in the one to come and he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church which is his body the fullness of him who fills all in all the kingdom of jesus begins at his resurrection at his resurrection, he's seated on high at the right hand of the Father. And it's important that we, that we re, you know, I'm warning us about having an over-realized eschatology, but we can have an under-realized one. I don't know that's a real term, but you know what I mean. <laughs> we need to grasp that truth that, that Jesus doesn't receive his kingdom at his return. Sometimes we can think of that as, oh, it's all terrible, and we're just waiting for Jesus to come, and then the kingdom will begin. But no. He receives his kingdom before that, doesn't he? He receives it at his resurrection. He's ruling now. He is ruling. But we do not yet experience the fullness of his kingdom. Look at the parable. It tells us, it helps us to understand this, doesn't it? It was in the foreign land that the nobleman received his kingdom. It was while he was away that he received it while he was away from his servants and so for his servants and for his citizens the ones that didn't chase after him they do not yet experience the fullness of his kingdom until he returns back do they but he still reigns he is still their king even though he hasn't yet come back that's important for us to see and one other thing that's important for us to notice in this parable that it pictures for us What does he do? What does the nobleman do before he goes to get his kingdom? Look at verse 13. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten miners and said to them, engage in business until I come. The servants receive something from the master before he leaves. They get something from him. He gives them something. But it is not yet everything he has to give not yet we see that later don't we when he returns he gives them so much more later when he returns is when that is when they truly benefit from the kingdom that he has secured in his leaving and so it is with church and jesus there is hope we have been given something we haven't been left desolate penniless waiting for his return he has gifted us in in many ways the most obvious way is when he gave us and outpoured the holy spirit the comforter the paraclete but also we have assurance don't we 
We have assurance. We have holiness, righteousness, sanctification, faith. All these things he has given us. All things that will help us in this time while we await his return. Gifts that we must use whilst we wait for his return. And we'll have a bit more on that shortly. We do experience something of his kingdom and his reign even now. But we we don't yet have the fullness of it. We don't have perfect bodies. We don't have perfect wills. We still get sick. We still are poor. We still get tempted and we still sin. And you know what? This is a big one. We still can't see Jesus face to face. We have his word. We have the spirit illuminating that word to us. We have the comforter. But that's not enough. It's okay to say that. I want to see Jesus. I want to see him face to face. And if we think that this is all there is, we're missing out. And we're not waiting as we should to stand in Jesus' presence when we see him face to face in the flesh, when we can touch him and talk to him as we will one day. The death Resurrection and return of Jesus is what this parable portrays with a focus on what we need to be doing, what we need to be busying ourselves with, what we need to do whilst we wait for his return. Because what happens when he returns? What happens when the nobleman, now king, returns? Judgment. Judgment. There is judgment when he returns and and he judges them on their response to his kingship. And what we see here is three responses. Three responses to the king. The first response comes from the citizens. Look at verse 14. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. This would be perhaps common if a nobleman was trying to gain a kingdom from from whoever was ruling Maybe some people from the tower will say, look, we don't think he's fit to rule. They'd go with him as an opposing delegation. We don't want this man to rule over us. These are people who are citizens of, of the man's land and, and, and of his kingdom. Uh, and they are people who he is to rule over. They are his people. He has a right to rule over them. But clearly, how do they feel about his authority? How do they feel about him receiving kingship? Well... They hate it, don't they? They hate the very idea of it because they hate him. They reject his rule and they do not recognize his authority or his kingship. Who are these people? In the immediate context to which Jesus is speaking, the citizens and their actions represent the Jews' rejection of Jesus. After all, Jesus had come to be the king of the Jews. They they were the people through whom the Messiah was to come. He would be their king. He would be the one who would sit on the throne of David. The only one who could. But they instead reject him. And the parable, of course, as as, as they often do, paints in broad brushstrokes. Because, of course, not every single Jew rejected Jesus, did they? Many accepted him. The disciples amongst the first Sadly, though, the the nation of Israel today are still these citizens. They still reject the Messiah, but so too does the rest of the world. That's the immediate application, but so too does the rest of the world. Every man, woman, and child, as his creation, as image bearers of of Almighty God, are his people, are his citizens, and are under his kingship. And that's really important to see because... The citizens in the parable and in reality may have rejected his kingship. But does it stop them actually being under his rule? No. Of course not. They were still under his authority. Ultimately, even though they didn't want his rule, they were under his rule and they had to answer to him. And we see, don't we, that they had to answer for their rejection of him. Listen, the world one day, one day, The world, every single one of us, will have to answer to the king. Whether or not uh, they recognize him as such, everyone will have to come before him and answer their creator. 
And if they have rejected him, if they've rejected his authority and his kingship, what will the verdict be on their life? Verse 27. But as for these enemies of mine, enemies, those who did not want me, who opposed me, who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. Rejection of the king results in being cast out of the kingdom. And when that king, when that king who you have rejected is life itself, to be cast away from him, to be cast away from Jesus, is to be cast away from life, is to be cast into death. To reject Jesus is to choose death. In rejecting the rule of life, they have chosen death. That's the citizens. That's anyone who rejects Christ. The second response we see is that of the servants. And and really we should say that of the faithful servants. Because there's two servant responses, aren't there? Before we go any further, just to address the the issue of numbers here... um, Let's remember that this is a parable. It's teaching a spiritual lesson. And and some commentators are distressed by the fact that there are ten servants, but only three of them are addressed at the end of the parable. And just in case, just in case that's really going to bother you this evening, let's just deal with that very briefly. Because it tells us something as well. Like we're thinking this morning, actually, numbers are important, aren't they? Uh, The fact that there are ten servants is significant because it tells us that disciples are in view but not just the 12 so it tells us that Jesus is talking about disciples but not just the 12 disciples if there had been 12 servants then we might interpret it as he's just addressing the 12 disciples but clearly a larger application is meant now the number 10 we had it this morning didn't we and and Pastor Rich explained it very helpfully then but if you weren't there just a reminder 10 isn't the perfect number of completion as seven is but rather ten is a number of fullness Um, for example we see god's um the creation of the world he he creates the world with ten words we have the ten commandments Uh, we have ten generations from noah to abraham Uh, we have ten plagues of uh, of the exodus ten is a number of fullness and so Ten refers to a great many servants. Disciples in general are in view here. The fullness of servants. All disciples are addressed in this parable, not just the twelve, but all. And so that means you and me this evening, if we follow Jesus. And the fact that only three are addressed is probably more to do with Jesus keeping his story concise. He needed ten at the beginning to describe and explain who he was talking to, but he only needed three responses to be recorded. There are only three possible outcomes. Well, only two really, but we'll see that. Three was all that was needed to make the teaching point. And we also see, don't we, that triads are very important and very common in Jesus' parables. So just on that note of the numbers, we just need to remember, this isn't journalism. It's a Hebraic parable. So the numbers are important, and they don't need to add up in the Greek Western way that we think of these things. So what is the response of the faithful servants to the king? Verse 15. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know what they have gained by doing business. The first came before him saying, Lord, your miner has made ten miners more. And he said to him, Well done, good servant. Because you have been faithful in a very little, you shall have authority over ten cities. And the second came saying, Lord, your miner has made five miners. And he said to him, And you are to be over five cities. These two servants obeyed their master, didn't they? And it will become uh, clearer in in contrast to the third servant. But let me say now and and back it up later. These two servants, they knew their master. They knew their master and dare I say they respected him and perhaps they even loved him. They wanted to do well for him. They wanted to obey him in his absence. They wanted to follow his instructions. They wanted to make a profit for him. They wanted to work for him. That's who they were. They were his servants. Whether he was here or not, they were going to work for him. And what's the response they get? 
Well done, good servants. Because you have been faithful in a very little, you shall have authority over ten cities and five cities. And so the master's response comes in three parts, doesn't it? First of all, commendation, well done. A reason for that, well, because you've been faithful. And a promotion, a promotion, authority over ten cities. Before he'd left, he'd only been able to give money to them, hadn't he? He'd given them money. That's all he could give them, so that's what he gave them. But now he gives them cities. Cities. What they receive is in relation to what the king has gained. He gained a kingdom, and so they receive cities. They receive part of the kingdom. The scale is off the charts, isn't it? But notice this. This is significant. If the return of the king pictures the return of Christ, having read this, what should we expect when Jesus returns? What do we expect when Jesus returns? I wonder if, I won't ask you to shout out, but I wonder if you, what your answer to that might be. I, I suspect many of us might say, rest? It's a good answer. But does Jesus turn up and say, right guys, I'm here. Sit back, kick back and relax. You've been faithful enough. I've got it from here. Well, of course, in one sense, he does, doesn't he? We see that in in other parables. We we know that we will find rest in Jesus, that we already find rest in Jesus, and it'll be ultimate rest when he comes. But this parable tempers that for us. It balances it by showing us something of what that rest will look like. Because let me tell you, that rest is not going to look like you sitting on the sofa picking popcorn out of your jogging bottoms. I know you've all done it. It's not just me, all right? It's not going to be like that, okay? No, what we see here is that the reward for a duty done is a duty to be done. Here we see that the reward of a duty done is a duty to be done. The servants have been faithful. And so what's their reward? They get to keep serving the king. Keep working for his glory, which in turn is for their good. Do you realize that is what glory is going to be like? Living for and serving the king, serving each other. In fact, it's going to look like this, except for prettier. You look like church. But dare I say, even better than church. Perfect. Church perfected. Faithfulness now will result in service, in the completion, in the consummation of his kingdom. In the new heavens and the new earth. And our service will be of a greater scope and responsibility. If ten miners to ten cities is anything to understand, the scope and responsibility that we will be entrusted with is going to be off the charts. Let me say, if that doesn't sound very good to you, and I'm sorry, but I don't think you're going to enjoy heaven very much. If you're only serving, if you're only living in a certain way now because you're hoping it's going to get you in, because you're hoping it's going to get you some rest, you know, the sofa time that you really desire... If you have the outward appearance of faith, but you're trying to do, you know, just enough. If your aim is ultimately and simply just, let's not upset the king. Let's just not upset him. And then I can get the rest when he comes. Well, if that's you tonight, then I'd suggest that you are like the fool in this parable. And I'm calling him the fool. The third servant who doesn't really know the king. If that's what you want you think you do some stuff now to get something different later then you don't know the king you don't know the king so let's look at the third response then verse 20 the fool then another came saying lord here is your minor which i kept laid away in a handkerchief for i was afraid of you because you were a severe man you take what you did not deposit and you reap what you did not sow this is really sad this servant is foolish. He's, he's disobedient and he doesn't know the king, does he? He had been told to do business with the miner he'd been given. He was told to make a profit, but he doesn't even try. 
He doesn't love the king. He hides it in a handkerchief. And in those days, that was possibly the, the least safe way of hiding money. If you were going to hide money, at least do it properly, buried in the ground. That's what they did. So not only was he faithless, but he was potentially reckless with what he'd been given. He wasn't careful. He didn't value what he'd been given. And he continues in verse 21, I was afraid of you because you're a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. He has an excuse for his disobedience. He thought he knew best. And he thought that ultimately, well, it's not my fault. You're a scary man. It's your fault. He tries to shift the blame onto the master. Give a reason, give an answer, be a smart aleck. He says he was afraid because he viewed the king as being severe. Was he right? Was he right to view him as this? Was he right to be scared of him? In, in, in his view, in his estimation, he thinks, well, if I make money, you're just going to take it from me and I won't benefit. And if I lose money, well, then you're going to hold me responsible. So the best thing for me to do is to do nothing. Was this the right view of the king? Was he right in his claim that his master is severe? Well, let me ask you this. Was the king severe in his treatment of the other servants? No, he wasn't, was he? He's not a severe master, but a kind, fair, and generous master. He gave them cities. He lavishes his gifts upon them. He shares the goodness that he has secured, that he has earned. He's earned the kingdom, and he shares it. But this third kingdom saw him as severe. And so we can safely say that this third, this third servant didn't know the king. He didn't know him. Listen to how the king responds to this third servant, starting at verse 22. He said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank and at my coming I might have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, take the miner from him and give it to the one who has ten miners. And they said to him, but Lord, he, he already has ten miners. I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. The servant's excuse becomes the grounds for his condemnation. The master repeats the servant's claims here, doesn't he? He's saying that he's making the case that if the servant really thought this way about him, then he should have made some effort to do something beneficial with the money. Let me say here that the king isn't confirming the servant's assessment of him. Rather, he's calling him out. If you really thought the, servant, the master was a hard master, if you really thought that, then you should have done something. If you really thought I was hard and cruel, why hide it? Why hide it, the, 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 the miner? Do something with it. If the king is an egotistical maniac, then the servant should have done something to try and appease him. But if his assessment is wrong, then he's just insulted the master and failed to obey him. So either the slave is lying about how he views, sorry, about how he feels about the master to excuse to excuse his, his lack of response. So either he's lying say, about what he feels about the master to try and excuse why he's done what he's done. Or he seriously misjudged the master. Above all, he's failed to respond properly to the king, hasn't he? And so we say that the third servant is a fool. He's a fool who does not know the king. And what's the judgment on him? Well, he loses what he already had. He ends up with nothing. In this parable, we see there are three responses to Jesus that we're told about. But interestingly, really, there are only two judgments. There are only two judgments. There are three responses to Jesus, but there are only two responses that Jesus makes on them. 
You see, the third servant represents people who are related to the king, who are related uh, to the kingdom in that they are associated with the community. They're associated with the community of faith, uh, and they may even have responsibility in it. People who are associated with church, people who may even have responsibility in church, but who ultimately don't know the king. Their attitude shows that they haven't trusted him. And so such people on judgment day are left with nothing. And you know what? They are the saddest of them all. The third servant is the saddest of them all. Even sadder than the citizens. Because the third servant had something. He was given something. He had something. He had something that the citizens didn't have. He had insight and he had opportunity and yet it is still wasted let's just try and draw some of these thoughts together it's one of it's a great parable it's one of the most complex parables and it's the last parable that we see in the journey narrative this is one or two more when we get to jerusalem i think one more But there's so much in here when you read it and you see what's going on. But let's just try and draw some of these thoughts together by way of application. If you're going to take one thing away this evening, take away this. The way God judges people is to give them what they have chosen. The way God judges people is to give them what they have chosen. If you live this life having chosen to reject Jesus on the day of his second coming, on the day of his coming, on the day of judgment, he will hand you over to that rejection. He will let you go. God will hand you over. The second thing we see, so the first thing we see is that God judges people by giving them what they've chosen. The second thing we see is that God judges people by giving them what they have chosen and we will choose based on how we view Jesus. We will choose based on how we view Jesus. So get to know him. Read the Bible. Come to church. He is not a severe master. He's not a hard master. He is a loving, giving master self-sacrificing king who was nailed to a cross in your place. He's not a severe master. He loves you. And he wants to bless you abundantly at the consummation of his kingdom. The third thing we see is that, to put it all together, God judges people by giving them what they have chosen. And we will choose based on how we view Jesus And so how we live now, putting those things together, how we live now will decide how we live later. How we live now will decide how we live later. How we love now, how we respond to Jesus now, how we respond to the gospel now, that will determine our eternity when the king returns, when he comes and takes his earthly throne when he makes the world new when he does that what do we want to hear what do we want to hear from him well done good servants you've been faithful isn't that what we want to hear from the king when he returns don't we don't we want a place in his kingdom don't we want to serve him don't we want to have responsibility in the kingdom don't we want to work for him Then look for his return. Keep that focus on his return. Use what he has given you. Serve, sacrifice, love now so you can keep on serving and loving in the kingdom. Be in church. Love his bride. Love his people. Study the word. Make disciples. Preach the gospel. Obey. There are many who live their lives rejecting Jesus. We know this, don't we? We see them, we we have loved ones, we work with people who just reject Jesus. And the truth is there will be no joy for them on the day of his return. But then again, they're not going to want what he can give. 
because they don't want it now. If they don't want him now, they're not going to want him then. But most to be pitied above all, as I said before, are those who have been given something and lose it. And I would say that perhaps that's the biggest application for us here, the biggest danger to avoid for, for some of us, some of you in this room. You see, the citizens, they had nothing and they end up with nothing. But the foolish servant who, who didn't really know the king, who worked for the king, who was around his, him all the time and around his people all the time and still didn't know him, he had something. He was given something. And yet he loses it. He ends up with nothing. That's the saddest thing that could possibly happen. It's to be given something by the king, only to lose it. And there will be many on the day that Christ returns who will be required to answer for their minor who will be required to answer for what they've been given. And that may be Christian parents. That may be a faithful pastor. That might be a lifetime of church, hearing the words. You could have had all those things, and yet still not actually know the king. Don't let that be you. If you are here this evening, then you've heard the words. You've received something. If you're listening to this online and you've heard the gospel and you stand without excuse, get to know the king. Use what he's given you. Young people, there'll be some of you, whether you're here in this room or listening elsewhere, there'll be some of you young people, and it breaks my heart to think it, but there'll be some of you who will squander the faith that you've been brought up in. You'll go to, maybe to work, you'll maybe go to university, and your heads will be turned. Your heads will be turned, or be tempted to be turned. You'll hear lies about the king. You'll hear lies about how he's severe. You're going to hear lies about how he's a harsh man. Don't. I plead with you. Don't listen to them. Walk with the king until he returns. Get to know him. Study what he said. Spend time in the words. Love him. Jesus is ruling. His kingdom is now and it's yet to come. So don't lose faith whilst we, we wait for the fullness of the kingdom. Don't get taken in by silly lies. Don't, don't waste what you've been given. Don't waste the gospel that you've heard. And don't expect the kingdom fullness until Jesus returns. And while we wait, remain faithful, not in your own strength, but in Christ's. Look to him, look to what he's done. We do that by remembering what the king has said. He, he's not with us anymore. The nobleman went to a far country, but he left his command. He left his word for his servants. Read it, know it, listen to what he said. Work for his glory, make disciples, preach the word. Jesus is coming back. He's coming back. He secured the kingdom and he's coming back. And what we do until he returns, how we respond to him and his judgment upon us when he does return, all depends on knowing him now, on knowing who he is, on seeing him and responding to him. Let's pray.